This program is brought to you by Emory University. Um, let me add my welcome and thanks to that of Dean Shapiro and, and Professor Alexander. Uh, as Dean Shapiro said, my name is Silas Allard. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Law and Religion. You may not see much in the way of religion on today's schedule, though it is certainly, as Dean Shapiro pointed out, always lurking in the background when we talk about immigration. Uh, the treatment of the stranger, the treatment of the immigrant, the sojourner in our midst, it's a long-held and widely discussed topic in the scriptures of many of our traditions. But this conference is also the continuation of a conversation that our center is having on immigration. Uh, earlier this semester, on September 19th, we held another conference in the same auditorium with the Religion News Writers Association. In that conference, we looked at the religious dynamics and aspects of immigration, how religion influences immigration, how immigration influences religion. And today, taking the second part of the center's name, we lick a hard look at the legal aspects, in particular what it means to ensure access to justice for the immigrant. The question we pose today, what it means to ensure access to justice, is no small matter in the context of immigration. The 2012 American Community Survey put the total immigrant population in the United States at 40.8 million. There are a huge number of immigrants living among us. In the southeast, in our region, between 1990 and 2010, five states, including Georgia, saw over 250% increase in their immigrant population. And Georgia is now the ninth largest immigrant state in the country, which was certainly not true just a few years ago. What many of you know and what these statistics remind us is that when we speak of our neighbors as scripture often does, we are speaking of immigrants. When we speak of our clients as lawyers, we are increasingly speaking of immigrants. Of course, immigrants living in the US face particular legal liabilities and difficulties, no matter what their status is, though status undocumented, documented, the variety of visa that you can hold is certainly important. But they are also hired and fired. They marry and divorce. They make deals and get cheated. And on occasion, they run afoul of the criminal law. In other words, immigrants, like the native born, need access to attorneys, courts, and the law as a matter of everyday life. But in the course of such proceedings, their vulnerability as non-citizens creates obstacles for immigrants and potential pitfalls for their attorneys. It is to this we turn our attention today with the help of many excellent speakers who I, and I'm sure you, are very excited to learn from. But first, it's important to spend a little while thinking about the particular intersection of immigration and our legal system, which occurs around the question of status and often ends in the Executive Office of Immigration Review more commonly known as the immigration courts. To offer us some thoughts on access to justice and the immigration courts, we are greatly honored to have with us the Honorable Dana Lee Marks. Judge Marks is the current president of the National Association of Immigration Judges, where she has served as both vice president and president since 1999. Judge Marks has also served as an immigration judge in San Francisco since 1987. Before joining the bench, Judge Marks was in private immigration practice for 10 years, and while in private practice, she worked across the many areas of the immigration law spectrum. But to note a particular highlight of her time as an immigration attorney, Judge Marks served as lead counsel and orally argued the landmark asylum case with which many of you will be familiar, INS v. Cardoza Fonseca in 1987. Judge Marks is also a tireless advocate, writing for scholarly journals, newspapers, and magazines, making television and radio appearances, and testifying before Congress to safeguard judicial independence and guarantee the necessary resources for the work of the immigration courts, two issues that she will speak about with us today. These efforts have earned her the Leader in Human Rights Struggle Award from the East Bay Sanctuary 
Covenant, the Philip Burden Immigration and Civil Rights Award from the Immigrant Legal Resource Center, and the Clara Foltz Feminist Society Award for the Woman Alumna of the Year from Hastings College of Law, her alma mater. We are honored and delighted to have such a celebrated attorney, judge, and advocate with us today. And I look forward, as I'm sure you do, to learning from Judge Mark's wisdom and expertise. Judge Marks. Good morning. So every time I speak, I start with the mundane. The mundane is my disclaimer, since I'm an employee of the United States government. I'm here in my capacity as president of the National Association of Immigration Judges. Uh, anything that I say here today does not necessarily reflect the views of the United States government, the Department of Justice, or the Executive Office for Immigration Review. Now, I'm considering using this information and, and, and your reaction to it as a psychological assessment tool. Um, if at the end of my remarks, you might perhaps think that I was expressing the official opinion of the United States Department of Justice, you should exit the auditorium immediately, go across the street to the medical center, and seek professional psychological help. Uh, during my remarks, when I use I, I mean just plain old me. And when I use we, I will be referring to the National Association of Immigration Judges, uh, my organization. So here we are today, talking about justice for all, about ensuring ethical representation and access to justice for immigrants. What a lofty goal to tackle. And I'm really glad that we're here today together to do that. But I feel that my contribution to today is to bring us down from the heights of idealism, although they're very necessary, and to discuss the sobering perspective that I have and will share with you from the trenches, from the front lines. I'm asking that everyone here today help us concretely define what justice really looks like and help us to assure that justice is achieved in our immigration system. I have an idea as to how to improve the due process and access in our immigration courts, and I wanna see by the end of my remarks if maybe I can persuade you to agree with me. In order to set the stage, many of you who are not familiar with immigration law need an introduction to my world. So hang on to your hats because here we go on a whirlwind tour of an alternate legal universe. You may think you recognize the terrain, but here the normal legal laws, which are basic to our everyday practice, don't seem to function as we quite expect. Yes, I'm speaking of the through the looking glass world of the United States immigration courts. Experienced lawyers are surprised to encounter many of the things that I talk about today. Most members of the public do not have a clue of the realities of my world, and when they come face to face with them, they are often dismayed and shocked. Any fan of crime dramas can recite the Miranda warnings given when someone is arrested. You have the right to an attorney, and if you cannot afford one, one will be appointed for you. Not true in immigration court. Because removal proceedings are civil in nature, there's no right to appointed counsel. And this is true even though asylum cases are tantamount to death penalty cases, since that's what some applicants allege they will face if their case is denied. And even where the respondent, and that's the term we use uh, for those who the Department of Homeland Security alleges are not US citizens and who come before the immigration courts, even when a respondent doesn't fear persecution, many of them face exile to a country that they don't really know, a country that they came to, uh, from when they were children, and the fact that they have lived legally in the United States since they were children will not prevent them from being mandatorily detained and perhaps forcibly deported. 
people are shocked to find that some criminal convictions, which are not violent nor felonies, cause these lawful permanent residents to lose their status and be removed from the United States. One example I'm very familiar with, since I'm from California, is that in California, a petty theft with a prior conviction is an aggravated felony under our immigration laws. So although one has the privilege of having an attorney's help, that is only if you can afford to pay for one or if you find a willing volunteer. This is true even though the respondents in removal proceedings carry the burden of proof. They have the legal obligation to prove they are eligible to remain in the United States or that they qualify for some form of relief under our complicated immigration laws once the government shows that they are not United States citizens. Last fiscal year, just over 40% of the individuals in our courts were unrepresented, a figure which rose to 85% when you only consider the detained population. As you look around our courtrooms, you see immigration judges who are doing so many things at once that they look like the guy behind the curtain in The Wizard of Oz. We certainly don't have the posh trappings that you see on television. Instead of a court reporter, immigration judges operate digital audio recorders which create a formal record. Most of us do not have bailiffs in the courtroom to maintain security for us, and we don't have clerks to mark or archive the exhibit we receive. A significant number of us hold the majority of our hearings via video teleconference, where the respondent is alone at a detention facility, watching the courtroom on a monitor as if he or she were not an essential player in that drama. And for years, we have been rendering complex oral decisions from the bench weighing all the evidence and applying a nightmarishly intricate statute immediately at the end of testimony, and usually without the benefit of a judicial law clerk to help us research legal issues or to wade through the reams of country conditions documentation which are presented to us when we are fortunate enough to have the respondent represented by skilled legal counsel. Last year, 83% of the cases we heard required the use of a foreign language interpreter in one of more than 260 different languages. And even more difficult, immigration judges are operating without the rules of evidence, without traditional discovery, and we are trying to decide a witness's credibility generally speaking, without hearing the testimony of any other witnesses to the event or any concrete corroborating documentation. Because to paraphrase one higher court's observation, people rarely are able to present a note from their dictator explaining why they have been targeted. We miss, must make these complicated decisions by placing the stories into a context and a culture which is literally foreign to most of us. So here are the immigration judges, in effect hearing death penalty cases, or contemplating an order which will amount to permanent exile for someone in an adversarial setting where a huge number of the respondents are not represented by counsel, applying a law that's repeatedly compared by the circuit courts to tax law in its complexity, as the day progresses, you will hear from various panels about the complicated areas of intersection between the immigration laws and the state criminal family and labor laws that you may be familiar with. Those who are experienced practitioners in the field recognize that our specialty field is much like a sedimentary rock formation consisting of multiple layers that we must excavate through, like miners, to try to find that vein of precious metal which copious amounts of, in, uh, of uh, slag obscures. All too often, that's how I feel when I try to analyze the intersections of various laws which have passed over time 
and try to figure out how those laws apply to the individual case before me. And we expect pro se litigants to navigate that task? You must also take into account the fact that common sense does not seem to prevail in our current law under many situations. To say that immigration law is counterintuitive is a gross understatement. For example, there is no statute of limitations, so the convictions which bring many people into our courtrooms can be decades old. And even when a person is now a respected pillar of his or her community, our immigration law often ties the hands of judges by giving us little or no discretion in many, many situations. People unfamiliar with our field often wrongly be believe that immigration judges can just do the right thing. Few people, lawyers and lay people alike, realize how little flexibility or discretion immigration judges actually possess. Add to this picture the fact that there are only 20, 225 field immigration judges located in 59 courts around the country with a current national caseload of 408,000 pending cases. That averages to more than 1,800 pending cases per immigration judge. But because caseloads aren't evenly distributed, there are judges like me. I have almost 2,500 pending cases that I left at my office on Wednesday. Prior to reorganizing our docket to address the recent surge from the southwest border, it was taking about 15 months for the first arraignment type hearing in my courtroom, and anywhere from another three and a half to four years for a final merits hearing to be held. We accomplished this by spending an average of 36 hours a week on the bench in court, with the assistance of maybe one quarter to one third of a judicial law clerk, because in most courts, three or four immigration judges share a single judicial law clerk. Our resources are stretched so thinly that I know of colleagues who have to pull their own cases for the day and routinely struggle to track down submissions by the parties which have not been routed to them for review prior to the day of the hearing. In the last few months, in an effort to assure that long waits in our courts did not become an incentive to enter the country illegally, our dockets have been turned on their heads. And for the first time, cases of recent arrivals are being put first, leaving behind those cases which have been pending for years those are placed in limbo for an indefinite period of time. The chaos which this has caused our dockets cannot be overstated. By now you must be wondering, how did we get to this point? How could this morass come about? And perhaps even more importantly, as I often ask myself, is this the kind of court system that we as Americans can hold out as a model of justice to the world, realizing that our immigration courts are often the only view of our legal system that many foreign-born individuals will ever experience. I haven't seen a lot of in-depth analysis as to why we're at this juncture now. Personally, I attribute it to being an artifact of chronic neglect coupled with inevitable evolution. Following the New Deal era, the broad outlines of our current legal structure were put into place. And the wisdom at that time was to put decisions like the ones we immigration judges make daily into the hands of administrative agencies. The idea was that agencies would operate by using their rulemaking authority to set broad guidelines that as experts in a narrow field they would be uniquely qualified to establish the scope of such guidelines and that only relatively case-by-case -case adjudications in an adversarial setting would be needed. Agencies at that point were widely accepted 
as the ideal way to spare our Article III courts from the kinds of small adjudications that we in the immigration courts routinely perform. But as time went on, both the number and the stakes in immigration proceedings became higher and higher and higher. Meanwhile, the decisions required to be made in the immigration courts were increasingly less about the boundaries of these broad categories and more about the individual cases and controversies. In the 1940s and 50s, the philosophical approach employed when drafting our nation's immigration laws was to view immigration law from the perspective of an exercise of authority by a sovereign nation, making broad decisions as to which classes of immigrants we should allow to join our community and our society, and who we should choose to exclude, basically as an extension of our country's foreign policy and sovereignty. Yet while given tremendous lip service historically, in recent years, there's a lot more recognition placed on the actual reality. Our immigration laws are rarely used as a tool of foreign policy, but every day they dramatically impact families, individuals fleeing persecution, and our business and labor communities. As the philosophical underpinnings of our immigration law have changed, I believe it can be argued that the sedimentary rock-like foundation of our law has increasingly shown its weakness and instability, undermining the support we need for the decisions who operate under this law. Another very practical reason as to why we are facing the current crisis is because of the very structure of the immigration courts. Until 1983, the immigration courts were housed in the Legacy Immigration and Nationalization Service, the INS. Both of them were components of the Department of Justice. Successful prosecutors were rewarded with promotions to the position of Special Inquiry Officer, a title which legally preceded our current title of immigration judges. In 1983, the Executive Office for Immigration Review, EOR, as some of us affectionately call it, EOR was formed. It was a tiny agency, dramatically overshadowed at the Department of Justice by its bigger, stronger, more well-known sibling, the INS. It was back then that we nicknamed ourselves the Legal Cinderellas, feeling that we were often the mistreated, less loved stepchild, relegated to leftovers and rags. In the aftermath of 9-11, when the INS was reorganized and placed in the newly created Department of Homeland Security, we at the National Association of Immigration Judges fought hard to achieve independence from the prosecu prosecutorial agency which appeared in our courts. We argued simply that it was not seemly for the boss of the prosecutors to be the boss of the judges. We were successful in keeping the immigration courts and our appellate older sibling, the Board of Immigration Appeals, housed at the Department of Justice, hoping that the separation of the everyday prosecutorial functions from the agency which housed the neutral adjudications functions would allow the immigration courts to come of age, to be the favored only child of the Department of Justice, and to provide us with the respect that the public we serve deserves. Unfortunately, time has shown that we are still treated as the oft-forgotten stepchild of the United States Department of Justice. While our role is to serve as a neutral court, Today, we remain housed, quite paradoxically, in a law enforcement agency. The Department of Justice, with its strong reputation and identity, hard won and deserving of much respect, is nevertheless an agency whose mission does not comfortably align with the role of neutral adjudication, nor does it provide the immigration courts 
with the independence that we require. Because we have been left at the mercy of the political winds which constantly buffet immigration issues, we have been chronically resource starved for well over a decade. The financial needs of the immigration courts simply have not been made the priority that the work we do requires. A budget which is 1.7% of the $18 billion annually allocated to immigration law enforcement is clearly inadequate and the strain is showing. Due to the current crisis caused by the surge of unaccompanied children at our borders, serious focus has been placed on the courts recently. Unfortunately, the picture revealed is not a pretty one, despite our many accomplishments and the remarkable amount and quality of the work that's being done by immigration judges and their staff every single day. Morale at our courts is at an all-time low. We are facing unprecedented numbers of potential retirements. And the task ahead, what looms on the horizon for us, would be daunting to even the most well-equipped, well-resourced system. Yes, we must acknowledge that all too often our dockets prove true the adage that justice delayed is justice denied. So today, we at the National Association of Immigration Judges, along with several prominent legal organizations and scholars, envision a fundamental structural change to our system. The American Bar Association, the Federal Bar Association, the American Judicature Society, as well as several other reputable legal organizations agree on this solution, but it is not one which will be quick and regrettably not one which will be cheap. Fast and inexpensive approaches have been tried and failed so many times that it seems absurd to ignore their futility. Rather than a knee-jerk reaction to the present crisis, we must take this opportunity to address the structural flaws which have allowed the crisis to impact the courts so adversely. What is the solution? We must establish an independent immigration court under Article I of the Constitution. The idea is not new. It dates back as far as the Select Commission on Immigration held in the early 1980s. It's been bandied about since then, but it's often summarily dismissed as being too expensive, although honestly there's no hard data to really support that assertion. It is clear that we need an independent court system which can stand on its own to provide transparency to the American public as to what we do, how fast we do it, and what our funding needs are, and to make sure those are met in a consistent and direct fashion so that they are not ignored and sublimated to political priorities. So as we go through the day, we put together, we're going to put together our list of characteristics necessary for ethical representation and for access to justice for all. Surely, surely you will agree that decisional independence comes at the top of that list. Immigration law enforcement must stand on its own and not be allowed to overshadow or control the immigration judicial process as it has in years past. The results of that approach are clearly reflected in the dysfunction apparent in our immigration court system today. For example, history has told us we should expect surges, like the past flow of Central Americans in the early 80s, Cubans, Haitians, Chinese, just to mention a few. This current border surge should not be cited as unique or unexpected. To be efficient, to operate economically, and to guarantee fairness, 
Our immigration courts need to be independent from both the prosecutors and the respondents who come before us. In order to withstand the political firestorms, which surely will continue, we need the protection of judicial independence upon which all other courts rely. Now, I don't expect you critical thinkers to just take my word for it. So I'm gonna give you some important facts which I think will help lead you to the same conclusion that I have, but I need to spend a little time doing so. I'm going to give you some very specific examples of how the current placement of our courts inside a law enforcement agency causes problems that would be solved by establishing the immigration court under Article I of the Constitution. Here's one. Although the law considers immigration judges to be administrative judges, our agency considers us to be attorneys representing the United States government. In essence, we're being asked to serve two masters at the same time, and the masters have very different priorities. A judge is supposed to be an independent and fair arbiter, while an attorney advocates for his or her client's position. How can we be neutral and independent if we are an attorney representing the same government as one of the parties who appears before us? The conflict inherent in being asked to serve two masters manifests itself in many ways. One example is the fact that we immigration judges lacked contempt authority over attorneys who are appearing before us from the Department of Homeland Security. While there is a regulation which allows sanctions for private attorneys who appear before the courts, 18 years ago, Congress recognized that this was unfair and inadequate and passed legislation giving immigration judges the authority to hold in contempt any attorney, including a government attorney, who appeared before us. 18 years later, the Department of Justice has failed to enact implementing regulations, the necessary regulations to allow immigration judges to exercise that contempt authority. Why? Apparently, they accept the arguments made by the Department of Homeland Security that mere Department of Justice attorneys should not be in a position to sanction sibling government attorneys. Here's another example. It is a fundamental rule of virtually any court system that ex parte communications, communications by a judge with one party outside the presence of others, is not allowable, basically because it's not fair. However, communication about cases between supervising judges of the immigration courts and supervising attorneys of the Department of Homeland Security who prosecute those cases is commonplace. Why? We have the same client. In some cases, we've seen ex parte contact lead to the discipline of a judge. In one recent case, where the DHS complains about a judge's delay in issuing a decision in a contested case, we saw it lead to the suspension of a judge, where the private attorneys and the respondents never knew of the complaint or the disciplinary action. Another area. Another area where immigration judges are called upon to act inconsistently with their role as judges is in the realm of recusals. In a normal court, one of the parties may ask the judge to recuse him or herself if the judge has a, or may have a personal interest in the conflict which, which could conflict with the fair adjudication of the case. In addition, a judge can advise the parties of any potential conflict and ask them if they want the judge to recuse him or herself. However, in our courts, the Department of Justice has interposed itself as an additional party in the recusal decision. Since the department views immigration judges as its attorney employees, our supervisors believe that they should be able to make the call as to whether or not an immigration judge should recuse him or herself. This means that a judge, an immigration judge, cannot continue to participate in a case if the Department of Justice 
finds a potential conflict, even if the parties are aware of this potential and state they see no need for the judge to recuse. In a recent case, an immigration judge was ordered to recuse herself from all cases involving a specific nationality, even though she saw no potential conflict of interest, none had been raised by the parties, and the Department of Justice conceded there was no actual conflict. This is not the type of independent case-by-case -case adjudication that is expected of judges. Moreover, blanket recusals based solely on nationality, the judge was asked to recuse herself from cases of her own ethnic nationality, doesn't this raise serious discrimination issues for both the judges and the parties who appear before our courts? Here's another example. The recent docketing changes brought about in response to the Southwest border surge demonstrate how immigration judges are tasked with serving two masters under the current structure, rather than serving the public in the most efficient way. There is no other court I know of who would turn its docket on its head at the request of one party. But the immigration courts are flipping our docket, moving the cases of the newly arrived to the front of the line at the demand of the Department of Homeland Security. While in some instances it might make sense to hear these cases early, this is certainly not true in all of them. For example, if a child is coming here to be with his or her parents, who are already on the court's docket, wouldn't it make more sense to hear the parents' case first, rather than to send them to the back of the line while we hear the child's case? And children who have been traumatized by their journey to the United States often need more time, rather than less time, to obtain attorneys and to feel secure enough to tell their traumatic stories, which were the cause of why they came to this country. All the parties to our system would be far better served if the decision of whether or not to prioritize any given case were made on a case-by-case -case basis at the request of the parties or based on the judge's discretion in a way that would make judicial sense. We need a system which allows immigration judges to be judges and to make those decisions based on the individual factors at play in the cases before them, rather than on political priorities. Another example of how removing the immigration courts from the Department of Justice and creating an independent structure to administer our courts under Article I of the Constitution would assist the public is the impact it would have on addressing concerns about alleged judicial misconduct. Currently, immigration judges, as attorney employees, are subject to multiple codes of ethical conduct by the Department of Justice. As government attorneys, we are subject to the ethical standard applicable to high-level federal employees and public officials. As attorneys who are licensed by a given jurisdiction, we are subject to the code in the states where we hold bar membership and sometimes where we hear cases, which may be different. And by Department of Justice policy, we are also subject to the ABA model code of judicial ethics. Four codes? This in itself is problematic because conflicts do exist between these multiple codes. One example, to whom an ju immigration judge should report attorney misconduct when it's witnessed. Some codes would say it goes to the state bar. The government code says I should report it to my superior. Another ethical dilemma we place in this murky area is what are the proper ethical standards applicable when an immigration judge seeks to recruit pro bono counsel, a need which is arising with increasing frequency. But perhaps even more problematic is that at this time, when complaints are filed against a given immigration judge, they are handled as internal disciplinary matters against an attorney employee. These investigations take place in secret and sometimes are even kept secret from the judge, him or herself. 
it to me seems obvious that a transparent judicial discipline system where the public knows what complaints are filed and whether the judge is vindicated or sanctioned would serve the interests of all. Another example, the placement of the immigration courts in the law enforcement agency has led to funding issues as the recent surge of border crossings has brought more cases into the immigration courts the severe underfunding of our courts has been highlighted. Our courts are dependent on the budget of a law enforcement agency that sees us as an afterthought at best. Its priority funding is to law enforcement officers and prosecutors. DOJ sets its performance standards and achievements quantitatively by the number of arrests and successful prosecu prosecutions. These measures hold very little relevance in the immigration court setting. And the National Association of Immigration Judges has long struggled to get our supervisors to realize that case completion goals should be a tool to help decide what resources are needed to meet an ideal goal of how long these cases should be on our dockets prior to completion. How many judges you need to handle how many hearings in a certain time frame? rather than, as they are sometimes now, a measure of who's a good judge or who is not living up to his or her supervisor's ideal of optimal productivity. Because our missions are so different, the immigration courts today continue to be relegated to Cinderella status, getting whatever is left over after the more important programs at the Department of Justice are funded. As a result, instead of hearing all the cases on our docket promptly, within the first few months of someone being apprehended crossing the border illegally, or someone who is allegedly found in the United States in violation of status, our cases are delayed for years, allowing individuals to become enmeshed in our communities, sometimes to our detriment if they commit crimes, but sometimes simply causing heartache when they are able to integrate as good citizens but have no legal status. The current structure allows those who are not entitled to be here to linger, sometimes developing ties which are inhumane to sever, while at the same time leaving many who would be able to obtain legal status under our laws and would be able to become far more productive members of our community those folks, they're left in agonizing limbo. So these are but a few of the examples as to why I and the National Association of Immigration Judges and many other prestigious bar associations believe that the immigration courts are a piece of the puzzle that just does not fit into the law enforcement framework. Indeed, for the puzzle to be solved, we need to create and fully fund an independent system under Article I to administer the immigration courts. Our current placement and configuration hampers the immigration courts in providing meaningful access to justice to those who appear before us. As legitimate questions about whether justice delayed is justice denied, and as to whether someone, it can be said that someone has received their full measure of due process when their case is tried without universal access to counsel? These, cases, th these questions are pressing questions right now. Now, therefore, is the time to take the important step of structural reform by creating an immigration court under Article I. We predict that this improvement will not only enhance due process, and ensure that all who come before us are treated fairly, but it will also prove to be financially cost-effective. When litigants lose faith in trial courts, appeals abound. When there is a concern that due process is being denied, class action lawsuits are filed. There is economy and timelessness as well, timeliness as well. For when a case moves through a court system without undue processing delays, the outcomes are more accurate and the costs of repetitive 
reconsiderations disappear. Simply put, it is cheaper to resolve these cases in the trial level immigration courts instead of clogging our federal appellate courts. Yet our current system makes these expensive outcomes almost inevitable and costs far more than it would cost to invest in properly configuring our immigration trial courts in the first instance. So to bring us back full circle, because I'm right on time, when we look at the current state of our immigration courts, do we possess the necessary attributes for ethical justice and access for all? Does our current placement in a law enforcement agency permeate our operations to such a degree that true judicial independence is undermined? From an ethical perspective, where appearances are often as important as actual fact, can the current structure be justified any longer in light of the evolution of our immigration law, its ever-increasing complexity, and the impact on our society? Because today, foreign board members and family members in states like California are present in more than 25% of the households. In California, half of the children have at least one foreign born parent. Or take Texas, where one in three children has a parent who is an immigrant or that child is an immigrant, him or herself. We have the opportunity to make the immigration courts the model of American justice that we want the world to emulate. But to do so, we must take this important first step. There is one solution which will provide transparency, independence, and make clear our funding needs. Rather than continue putting fuel into a leaking gas tank, we believe the logical approach is to fix that tank before we refill it, although we don't deny we need that gas too. It's going to have to be refilled no matter what. We urge the common sense solution of doing things right the first time. We urge the creation of an Article I immigration court. And I hope you will agree. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.